Well, good evening. Um, my name is Pastor James. I am the campus minister, uh, ministry director of UCM here at UBCL. A uh, few quick facts about me. I am married. I have two boys, one who is 11, one who is nine. Um, that's grade six and four. Just got them off to school this week. Um, and other fun fact, I have been serving in campus ministry for 17 years. This is year 17 for me. That's right. I started when I was 12. Uh, no, seriously, I live, breathe, bleed campus ministry. I love this, and I'm so thankful to be with you guys uh, today. Um, when I was about your age, I was studying business administration at university, and I, too, stumbled upon a Christian group similar to this one. And I didn't know it at the time, but, but that would set me on a trajectory that really changed my life, like literally. Um, in grade 11, um, I had prayed and accepted Jesus into my life. I kind of did that, hey, I want to jump into this thing. But it wasn't really until I got into university where I had to figure out how to follow through on it. You, you know what I'm saying? You know the difference between saying yes to something and then following through on something like many of you have signed up for eight o'clock classes but that's totally different than actually showing up for those eight o'clock classes you know what I'm saying um, and that is a big reason why we are here why UCM is here on campus and why we want to help we want to help be a loving community on campus that will help people find Jesus and follow through with following Jesus so that's a big uh, part of who we are and what we're trying to do. Before I get going, though, I am loving seeing all these new faces. So I just want to say, welcome. Uh, if you're new to UCM, no, we've been praying for you. Like we have been praying for you. We've been praying for this transition. We've been praying that you would find a sense of belonging tonight and this whole first month on campus. Um, if you just moved to Kelowna, I want to say, welcome home. That's right. This is your new home. Kelowna is your new home. Because over the next four years, right, this will become a new home for you. Maybe some of you actually still literally live in Kelowna, but hey, UBC and this community is going to be a new home for you. And so that's what we're all about. That our mission of UCM is to kind of make on-campus Christian community right where you are, that you might encounter God in this season of life. So a couple of things that we're committed to. One, you have arrived at the one of the main things. We we are committed to meeting every Thursday night for worship, um, for teaching. We'll always talk about a relevant you know, subject to your life. And tonight we start uh, our series and one of our core values about uh, finding authentic community. So we know community and finding authentic community isn't easy, especially under these circumstances. We did not all expect to be on Zoom tonight for Pete's sake, but we, um, we know that the life Jesus wants for everybody is to be in loving community. And so that is our goal, and that's what we're going to talk about this month. Um, anybody out there, uh, Oscar fans, anybody watch you know, the Oscar movies? I know some people don't like Oscar movies, some people like them. I'm kind of a little bit of a movie nerd and uh, I love Oscar movies. Um, this last year was a weird one because we didn't really get to go to theaters and that sort of thing. But does anybody know the best picture? What movie won best picture this last year? Anybody throw it in the chat? Give me your best, best guess. Um, let's see, Parasite was the year before. Very good, whoever that was, Camille, yes. That was two years ago, though. I know. See, this last year was a, a blur. Nomad Land winner, Lois. You got it. Lois, well done. Um, Nomad Land. So, this movie, Nomad Land, stars Frances McDormand as a van dwelling working nomad. And she leaves her hometown after her husband dies, and the sole industry in her town had closed down. And so basically she's, she's homeless, but she says, hey, I'm not homeless, I'm houseless. And I've chosen to be houseless, right? She's always on the road. She, stopping, she stops here and there at times to work at Amazon warehouses, get other temporary work. The movie, I mean, it's an Oscar movie, right? So it's hitting on themes that I think were true in our culture today. And, and one of the 
you know, beautiful side of the movie is it sort of shows us how in short periods of time you can have meaningful encounters with people. But on the, on the more dramatic, sad side, the movie really concludes with her inevitably being unwilling to settle down anywhere. And consequently, she keeps you know, not having relationships in her life. And the movie sort of concludes with the sense that she's going to end up alone. She's going to go through the remainder of her life alone. Well, that's the end of the movie. That's how Oscar movies sometimes end, not happy endings. Um, I think the movie hits on a theme that, that is worrisome today, right? We've gotten used to being alone. Um, I read a book, uh, well, reading a book called Alone Together. And the subtitle is Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other. It's written by Sherry Turkle. She's a professor at MIT. She spent 30 years studying the psychology of people's relationship to technology. And that's her argument, is that even though we're more connected than ever, we're feeling this, this great sense of loneliness. Um, just think of how many people pull out their phones when they're in the presence of other people. We keep, you know, we, we want to be connected, but we're, we're not sure how to be with people. She actually has followed up, and I haven't started this one, but I ordered it, is her follow-up is reclaiming conversation, reclaiming conversation, the power of talk in a digital age, because yeah, we need to figure this out. We need to figure out how to do this still. Maybe through this pandi pandemic, you've gotten rusty at pursuing community. Maybe with all the digital substitutes like Zoom and Insta messaging and following people's Insta stories, maybe you become passive with building community. Maybe, maybe you've always felt a bit awkward in group settings. <laughs> maybe you always have had a challenge at that and the pandemic has been a great excuse to neglect building community in your life. But the truth is, no matter what our circumstances, we all need community because we are all made for community. Every one of us are made for community. When you look at the story in Genesis, the first you know, biblical story in Genesis, it's a, it's a poem and this poem sings and the refrain is, and God said, and it was so, and then so, God saw that it was good. And it sings that over and over six times and God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. But in chapter two, when God looks at Adam, he says, it's not good, it's not good that he is alone. And this shouldn't surprise us after all, because he was made in God's image. All of us are made in God's image. And God has been experiencing community throughout all eternity in the Godhead, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is community. And when he made humanity, he designed us for, to need that same dimension of community life together. It's not good that we're alone. We all were made for community. One of the greatest stories um, in the Gospels about authentic community involves a man who is paralyzed and the four friends who bring him to Jesus. I want to read this story to you. And um, if someone wants to throw this passage in the chat, they can. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Mark chapter 2. When when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came bringing to him a, a, a man who's paralyzed, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him and having dug through it, they lowered down the mat on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the, to the man who was paralyzed, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. 
but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go home. And he stood up, immediately took the mat, and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Let's just pray for a sec. Um, Father God, I, uh, I thank you for this word. I thank you for your word. And um, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just open this up for us in our community in our time right now. Jesus name. So imagine what life was like for this man. Imagine what it would mean to be a person who was paralyzed in the ancient world. His whole life would have been lived on this mat, this three foot by six foot long mat. Someone would have to feed him, carry him, clothe him. Someone would have to clean him. He would never know a sense of independence that many of us take for granted today. In the ancient Near East, there were no healthcare benefits to cover you, so he would have had to go through life as a beggar. But um, in, in the passage here, we don't really learn much about this man. We don't know his name. We're not told many details. But we're all, we are told two things. First, we're told he has a mat, right? And that mat symbolizes what would have separated him from his community. It, it symbolizes what would have separated him from society. In Greek culture, they often disposed of newborns who had defects. In Roman culture, they would have actually encouraged even killing deformed children. In the Jewish culture, many would have believed that you, you got what you deserve. Uh, the sins of the father kind of thing. His mat was a symbol to others, not only of his physical state, but of his moral state. But we learn from the passage that he has something else. He has four friends. And even in our day, hey, like people with disabilities, they, they would express their difficulty of finding friends who aren't, you know, uncomfortable relating to them. But here in this passage, this guy has four friends. He has a band of brothers who refuse to let any of these barriers stop them. And his mat becomes his opportunity for acceptance and servitude. So there are, there are three points I wanna, I wanna point out to us in this passage that, that show us what true authentic community looks like. And um, the, first, uh, the first is this, friendships, don't happen by accident. These four friends broke the barrier of social stigma, of inconvenience, of time and effort. They chose to become friends. People rarely drift into community. Authentic community is something you have to choose to enter into. Um, every year that I've really pastored on campus, um, I would have one or two students come to me at some point in the term and they would express, you know, their frustration. They would, I would often hear statements like, hey, you know, I come to UCM, but nobody talks to me. Um, sometimes people would say, you know, I've gone to core group and, you know, I didn't connect with anybody. And I always tell them, I say, you know, community is not something that happens to you passively. We're not saying, hey, show up on a Thursday night and guess what? You're going to experience authentic community. We're not saying that. Community is something you have to choose to enter into. The second thing that this story teaches us is that authentic community requires trust. Think about this man. This man who is paralyzed, he could have said no, right? He could have said, you guys are crazy. What, you're trying to lower me into like down through a roof? I'm gonna be more injured, like no way. He could have said no. Authentic community, though, requires trust. It requires vulnerability. It requires belief in others. It requires a willingness to let others carry your mat. I think often um, one of the reasons why people find it hard to find authentic community is because they're, they're looking for people without mats, right? They're looking for community that's easy. They're looking for community that doesn't cost them anything. They're looking for community that's that's convenient. 
But the truth is, the longer you hang out in community, the sooner or later you will find out that everyone has a mat. Um, read this book quite a, while, quite a number of years ago uh, by John Orberg. It's titled, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know Them. <laughs> Title kind of says it all. Everybody's normal until you get to know them. Right. And he has this little illustration at the beginning of the book that he says, you know, you know, those stores, you know, go, you go into a store and they've sort of got a table or a rack at the back of the store and it's marked, you know, as is or like, you know, reduced sale, final sale. And, and you know, the packaging, someone like returned it, the packaging is kind of messed up, or maybe there was a mistake missing a button or there's a stitch missing or something. He says that that is what it is like with human beings. You've come to the kind of final sales corner of the universe because we are all fallen people and we are all living in this fallen world. Every one of us lay on our own mats as reduced final sale items before Christ. The third thing that this story teaches us is that authentic community always involves change. After those four friends crash through the roof, we read that Jesus forgives the sins of the man who is paralyzed. And we don't know what the man's thoughts were. We don't, we don't know what he's thinking, but I bet you he's thinking, hey, I just came to get healed. Like, why are you talking about my sins publicly? <laughs> but being in community kind of has a way of surfacing our sins. The more we meet together and share life together, the harder it is to hide our mats. The harder it is to hide behind masks. That's not a pun on mask wearing, by the way. <laughs> Honestly, um, this is what I love about our core groups. We're going to talk about core groups tonight. Core groups are our, our way of getting you guys to meet in person with each other and to study scripture and to hang out and get to know one another. And what I love about our core groups is that um, you can't hide in core groups. <laughs> you can show up, you know, one or two or three times and kind of use pleasantries and you can say you're fine and you, you know, maybe you'll admit, oh, I'm a bit stressed out right now from school. But mostly, if you keep attending core, if you keep showing up, right? You can't hide all semester long. I think this is honestly why some people drop out after the third week or so. Because you can't keep showing up and keep hiding. You can't keep showing up and saying, I'm fabulous. How are you? You can't keep saying the same prayer request every week. I'm stressed about school. Eventually, you got to go deeper, right? People get to know you. And guess what? They get to find out you're not normal because none of us are. And what we discover is that we are all in need of spiritual growth. We're all in need of change. We're all in need of Jesus. We all need friends who are willing to bring us to Jesus. Now, here's the thing. I know I said there's three uh, things I wanted us to learn from this passage, but I have a bonus one. I'm going to sneak the next girl in, okay? Notice whose faith moves Jesus to bring transformation in this man's life. Did you catch it? The passage says, when Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Take a look at the passage. It's not the faith of the man who is paralyzed. It's the faith of his friends that Jesus saw, demonstrating their care, demonstrating their belief that Jesus could bring healing into this man's life. And so the reason why I think this passage is so cool is because it teaches us that we need each other, right, in this journey. It teaches us that in order to meet with Jesus, sometimes we need our friends to bring us to Jesus. And when Jesus looked down on that mat, that that man who's laying on his mat, he did not only see a broken body, but as with all of us, he saw a broken soul. And he said, your sins are forgiven. And I want you guys to know that that forgiveness is available 
to each and every one of us. We just need to ask. We just need to be brought to Jesus. I just want to close with this story. Um, so I grew up in Manitoba, did my undergrad in Manitoba, and then I moved to Vancouver, uh, where I went to grad school, and I never left, <laughs> never left BC. I went there to study theology at Regent College, and, and you know, like I said, I had this wonderful, I, I had this community, this Christian community I'd formed at university, but now I'm moving out east, or west, and uh, I wondered, will I have friends again? Will I have authentic community again? And when I look back now and I think about that time in my life, um, I knew I had cultivated authentic community because I had a few friends like these friends in Jesus in this story. Um, and I know from this one moment, it was a day that I, honestly, I got dumped by the girlfriend that I had at the time. Um, quick story, I, I told this girl that I loved her and you know what she replied? She said, thank you. A week later, she dumped me over the phone. Oh, I was heartbroken. I was so sad. I was devastated. And I remember that day, I was very sad. And I was on campus, and I ran into one of my friends, Dan, this friend Dan. And I just ran into him. And, and honestly, Dan put his shoulder around, put his hand around my shoulder, and I just bawled my eyes out. I remember crying in front of this friend. And he just hugged me and he said it'd be okay. And then he said, Can I pray for you? Later that day, my friend Josh sought me out. He had heard the news from Dan and he went and tried to find me. Later that night, I went home and my roommate Dane, he listened to me all night. He talked with me, he let me talk it all out. He listened and listened and listened. And then before I went to bed, he said, hey, can I pray for you before you go to bed? You just will have good rest. I had friends who carried me to Jesus in a time when I couldn't do that myself. And what I want to ask you tonight is, do you, do you have people like that in your life? Do you have people who will carry you to Jesus? Do you have a band of roommates, of friends? Of, do you have a band of roof crashers in your life? Who are going to be those people for you this year? Maybe you've just moved here. Maybe this is all new and you're going through a kind of leaving one community, coming to another. And so it's not going to happen right away. It's going to take some time. And so I want to invite you and encourage you to find authentic Christian community this year. And it's not easy. I'm telling you, it's not easy. It takes effort. You have to choose to enter into it. You have to trust. But when you find it, it's pretty beautiful. And it's the life that Jesus wants for everybody. And so that's our invitation to you. Our invitation is to come join with us on Thursday night. Thursday nights is a great starting point. Um, go deeper. We encourage you to get into a core group. We're going to be launching these next week. Um, yeah. Um, let me pray. And then I'm, uh, I want to, um, um, our, our VP of Discipleship, Ryland, is going to talk a bit more about our core groups and a bit more about what you can expect there. So let me pray for you. Uh, Father God, I thank you for your word tonight. I thank you for each and every one who came tonight to hear from you. I pray that, um, that, that there was something here for each one of us. God, um, we need you, Jesus. Each and every one of us need our sins forgiven. Each and every one of us need to be healed. Each and every one of us are longing um, to be whole in you. Help us to encounter that in community. Help us to be that to, towards one another, I pray. And may our community, this community that we are, we are forming and launching again, May uh, may us may we step into that. Help us to step into that. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.